Hi there, Susan Kerbig, your mom. Hi, Sterling. So I'm stuck in traffic, <laughs> coming home from San Jose after training um, a few new salespeople up in the Eastridge store. So I'm gonna record a little video because there's no time like the present to just take care of these kinds of issues. You know, when you have cancer and you're over cancer or whatever, it makes you really think about life and death and how short life is. And, and it's a good idea to get these things down. And so, you know, it's always, there's never a perfect time to, uh, to talk about um, life and, and um, you know, your family history, which is what I'm going to do. Is I'm going to tell you a little bit about your family history um, so that you have it, so that it's in a place where you can look at it when you care. And, you know, maybe your children or your great-grandchildren or whoever might be interested in knowing the family history as well as I know it. So um, let me start with my dad's side first. And um, I did quite a bit of genealogical research back before the internet. So I have documents for all this. And so I'm kind of going off of my memory for the most part. And I'll, I'll see about if this video is any good and I'll put the documents in there. So, uh, you know, the documents might actually be more, will be much more accurate than my memory. But um, so you are the youngest child of a youngest child and that is uh, this is kind of hard to wrap your mind around you this is 2014 and you're 23 years old right now and your great-grandfather my dad's father Frank Gerbic was born in Slovenia I assume it was Slovenia at the time in 1864 so that was the year right before Abraham Lincoln was assassinated civil war was going on in America and it's really difficult to believe that my grandfather is that old I mean was born that long ago and yeah <laughs> that's what it is I've got documents and documents and documents that show this uh, Frank had a brother named Anton and I don't have all the particulars, but they came to America in probably the 1880s. I don't think they came through Ellis Island. And um, my grandfather, Frank, was probably, the stories were that he was a merchant. Um, he spoke many languages, which is pretty likely, considering where he was from, in the town, which we think is R-I-C-O-N, I think that's how you spell it, um, or I don't know how to pronounce it, was like sometimes part of Italy and sometimes part of um, Slovenia, and um, it just depended on what war <laughs> and who owned the property. It was right on the, right on the edge, right where Italy is um, kind of connected to where Slovenia is now. Um, at the time, when I was being raised, I was told it was Yugoslavia, and that's what it was at the time, and then it became recent well relatively recently its own country of Slovenia so it's very likely he spoke Austrian uh, Italian uh, maybe German uh, well that is if Austrian and German are totally different languages which I don't know I assume they're the same language maybe some dialects uh, Slovenian he probably spoke Croatian maybe some Hungarian so and you know what does it mean to speak other languages that's just the story it might mean that they, he was fluent it might mean he was able to speak enough to get by so I don't know but anyway so I don't know you know I'm putting my dad wrote a memoir right when computers were just coming out and so back in the 70s 80s so I have all those documents that he created and it's just going from his memory because my dad was born in 1919, I think, 1918, 1919, I think it's, I think we have one document that says 1919, and we have one that says 1918, so, <laughs> very poor, um, I don't, Anthony Anton came over to America, and he settled in Collingwood, Ohio, which was near um, Euclid, and I, from what I can gather, my grandfather, Frank, was not kind of a regular kind of guy. I guess he had, uh, I think he drank, uh, gambled, 
and so on. He married a woman named Emma, and I think her last name was, you know, I can't remember right now offhand, but they had five children, I believe. And one was named Anton, one was named Frank, uh, Antonia, I was the only girl, uh, a baby that died, and they had another child. Uh, I'll, it'll come to me in a minute. Randolph, Rudy. And um, Emma died. I have her death certificate. She, and I've seen, visited her grave, which is just an abandoned, very sad grave in Collingwood. And uh, she died probably after giving birth to, to a child. Um, she died of septus poisoning, which is like blood poisoning. A lot, I think it was common to have after a child's born, you know, a pregnancy. And the baby, I do have a death certificate of a baby, unnamed baby. And it was born on my birthday, August 8th, 1902. So I always named him, I named him Anthony because, you know, it's my choice. My, my birthday and I found him so um, so here's your grandfather my dad writes quite a bit about what it was like how poor they were and um, he's married to Emma and Emma dies well I don't know what happened to the children but I think the oldest one is named uh, Rudy Randolph he was on his own from probably the age of 13 on. Um, I don't know who raised the other children. I don't know if Anton, the other cousin, who was stable, he owned a, a grocery store, A. Gerbic, and um, he had children named, named them Antons. There are a lot of Antons in that family, and those children still, those children had children, so I've met them many times uh, when I went back to Ohio to find our family's history. So, um, you have an awful lot of cousins from Anton, from that, they're, you know, they're cousins that are there. So, going back to my grandfather, Frank, again, he, we don't know what he did, but until he married my grandmother, and her name is Mary Skufska, Skufska, something like that. And brought her from the old country back in Slovenia. I was told that she, they were very, very poor. They slept on the kitchen stove to keep warm at night. And uh, she looked, from the photos I have of her, like a bubushka woman, you know, a Russian, Russian woman with a big nose, and she wore all the scarves and stuff. She was, uh, you know, of course, I only saw pictures of her late in life. And Mary was much younger, and she gave my grandfather two children. One was Victor, and one was my grandfather, uh, my dad, Tony, Anthony. There's lots of Anthonys in her family, which is why you're named Anthony, Sterling Anthony, and even after my dad. So, um, my dad did not know his elderly, elderly, older brothers and his one sister. They were half sister and half brothers never met him um, hardly at all I think he did meet him a few times but he remembers his sister Antonia she married uh, a man um, named I think their last name is Kess K-E-S-S and she remember he remembers her taking him to a, a family party when he was a little boy it was a big treat because he was ex they were extremely poor which pretty much everybody was. That's what my dad says. Everybody was poor. Who know? Nobody knew any difference. This is the 1920s. So it was before the Great Depression when things got really bad. So my grandfather apparently drank a lot and gambled. And uh, my grandmother Mary, she never really learned English. She only spoke Slovenian. So my father only spoke Slovenian until um, high school to some extent. I mean, he learned English, but he was very, very embarrassed to speak. He had an accent. And it was only when he got into high school, when he had a teacher named Mr. Gray, 
wore gray. Everything was gray about him, and his name was Mr. Gray. He kind of got my dad to, you know, come out of himself and, and get involved in academics a little bit, and um, and to uh, work on his English and so on. So the older children, I found out much later. Okay, so I'm remembering now. There was John Randolph. Uh, Antonia, Antonia, I said married. She had a couple children. And John went into, was in World War I, never married. I think he was a, he used to fight like a boxer. Um, I have his war records and he went AWOL a couple times on his birthday and New Year's. He was in uh, uh, France and the very end of the war. I don't think he saw any fighting. It was, you know, kind of the last recruit at the very end of World War One. Rudolph, Rudy, went into the FBI. He became, he worked for the FBI. I'm not sure what he did. Um, another child, he was involved in the Collingwood fire in, it was on Good Friday in 19... 09, I believe. He was a child there. And uh, that was a very horrific fire. One of the most ghastly fires you can imagine. A school caught on fire and the children couldn't get out. The doors op opened inwards, which was common in those days. And the children couldn't get out. And their bodies, uh, they died of smoke inhalation. And they, they died in front of the doors. So, of course, you couldn't open in the doors because the the fire would, you know, they, they couldn't open them in because the bodies were piled up and lost 100 or 200 children. It was just, it was, it was just very awful. I remember as a child hearing this story and how horrible it was. Anton, the other brother, he had children there too. He lost one of his daughters named Anna in that fire. She died as well. The story is, um, and I have the newspaper reports and there's been a small book written on it, the Collingwood Fire of 1909. Um, the story is that um, one of your great uncles, one of my uncles, step uncles, he was in, I think in second or third grade and he was, he got a new jacket and he was told, you lose your jacket, you don't come home. So I think he was pushed out of a window, the second floor window at the fire and his jacket was gone so the boy didn't come home and it was horrific I mean these are children they're identified their bodies are burned up and they have them in a morgue and it was just parents are trying to go in there and identify their children and they they have little crucifixes and necklaces and things like that they're trying to identify the children and um, you know so they thought that they had lost their child and then he shows up like a couple days later because it was all confusion it was just the, the whole area of Ohio was just devastated by all these children's deaths and huge Slovenian population because people tended to live in neighborhoods. That same child, I can't remember his name for the life of me, if it was Anthony or not, I can't remember. He uh, was also involved in another fire of a, uh, I think it was a psychiatric hospital when he was an adult and it was very awful, horrible, horrible. Um, a gas line blew up, so, and um, people were, I guess, had been locked in their rooms, and they couldn't get out, and some awful things happened. It was really, really sad. And, but from what I understand, that was more common than you would think at that time. It was devastating, it was horrible, but, you know, that's how things were. They didn't have the safety measures and things that we have now. So, anyway. So as I said, my grandfather was an older man. He was born in 1864. And by the time my dad was born in 1919, he was the youngest child. I think that um, his father was already in his 60s. And he was, they were deathly poor. Uh, he worked along a, 
they were working on a road in Ohio called Upton Road. And my dad used to, they were, my, my grandfather used to go and put the lights on the road. Like they had kerosene lanterns and they put them on the road so the people could continue to work at night. And my dad would walk down there with a pail of um, lunch or dinner that my mom, grandmother would make. And, and my dad would go down there and sit with them while he ate his dinner at night. And that's some of the memories my dad had of his, of his father. In 1928, I believe, my grandfather was, um, and my grandmother and my dad were living in what would it be probably a garage, somebody's garage, and um, they were very Catholic. My um, dad and my grandmother went to church, and they came home, and there was grandpa, their you know their dad, dead on the cot probably in his 70s I believe and my uncle Vic um, was always a bit odd um, you know we didn't know anything about that at the time but we think it would I guess in my the impression I'm given now is that he probably had Asperger's or um, you know that kind of thing he served in World War II and when he came home my dad said he was even more um, odd. Um, it was, he was, couldn't keep a job uh, and he had, um, I think they said he had mustard gas. I don't know if that's true or not, which can do some odd things to you. I, I have no idea what World War II must have been like for him. I have his war records as well, but he never married, had no children. And, um, he was always a bit of an alcoholic in, you know, from what I remember and uh, didn't have great judgment as far as things. He smoked and drank and gambled and came to live with us when I was like 11. He was there for about six months and my mom just couldn't handle him and just said, when is he leaving? He needs to go. So he, he left. He went back and lived with his mom, Mary, in Ohio. I never met her. No, no, he didn't go back to Ohio to, he never went back to Ohio to meet, to live with his mom, because that wouldn't make sense, because I never knew my grandmother. She died December 18th, 1954, and I was born in 62, so I never met her. She, uh, she was an alcoholic as well. There's a lot of alcoholism in our family, which is, probably why my father almost never drank and in turn I didn't we didn't drink my father and mother lived in California and had almost nothing to do with the family back there there's hardly any family to have anything to do with there's no ties and um, alcohol was not really commonly used but I would be afraid that it's genetic in our family and that it was, it was very bad, so I don't know how much of it was just genetic or habit or I don't know. I have no idea, but I never really wanted to tempt fate and find out. So um, that's one of the reasons why I almost never drink, just because I never really wasn't in my family to do it. We didn't think about it. it just wasn't around. There was no alcohol in the house when I was growing up. So anyway... Uh, Victor stayed in Ohio most of the time, except for, like I say, that time when he came out when I was about 11. And um, he just, um, like I said, never had any children. The other people did have children, the other older siblings, but like I say, they weren't raised with my dad, so we don't know much of them. I have since. When I turned 30, I went back to Ohio and I did some research and I contacted a lot of them. We had a little party. They had a little party so everybody could meet me coming from California. And one guy came in. His name is Jazz. J-A-S. Kerbic. Jim. And he came in, he sat down, and he was about the age of my father and he looked just like my dad. My dad had been died many years before. My dad died in 89. 1989. And 
to see this man sitting there who looked just like my dad. And he would be a cousin. He would be a second removed cousin, I believe. But he looked so much like my dad. It was really weird. And then it was odd because I'm meeting these people. Rudy's child, who's also named Rudy, tells me, so I don't get it. You're our cousin? And I'm like, yeah. And he says, well, which cousin, how many cousins back? I said, I'm your first cousin. And it was really hard to believe because this man was in his 70s and I'm 30. And I'm saying, your father, your grandfather and my grandfather are the same person. So we're first cousins once removed. It's just kind of hard to believe. So I tell you, they didn't even know of us. They had no idea that there was this other family living in, old, in Salinas, California. Then, war came, World War II. My father was married to a girl in the neighborhood. Her name was Dale, D-A-L-E. And she was pregnant. And my dad got drafted for World War II. And it was devastating. My dad said he held, uh, he hid the letter. I've, I've contacted her too. She's since died. But I contacted her and she told me the stories of how my dad would hid the letter saying he was drafted for several days from her. He was so devastated because in their mind, going to World War II to fight was a death sentence. It was pretty awful. And here he is about to have his first child and he was going to have to leave her pregnant. So instead of getting drafted, he went and signed up, which is what, um, because if you're drafted, it looked worse on you. You didn't get to necessarily pick where you were going to go, and you would look, you wouldn't be treated probably as well as you would be if you, than if you signed up. So my dad went into the CBEs, S-E-E-B-E-E-S, and they're like, it's been identified to me as the Civil Corps of the, the, of the Marines. It was, it was like a Marine you had to fight. You know, you had guns and stuff like that. But they were the people who uh, carried um, shovels and pickaxes and, and they built things and so on. So the CBs would come in. So like the, the Marines would take on an island because my dad served in the Pacific. He was in New Guinea, uh, uh, Bougainville, those kind of islands over there and that in the war in the Pacific and the Marines would come in take over an island and then the next next planes would come in would be Seabees and they came in and they built the land landing strips the you know the roads um, the quarters for people and they did this in an island that was just barely cleared from enemy uh, and so there was always you know so there was gunfire and things like that my dad was wounded got some shrapnel and he had a purple heart and um, he, he fired his gun a few times. He doesn't know if he ever hit anybody, but uh, he fired his gun into the bushes and stuff. Um, he said that, and I've got pictures of him from the, that time. <laughs> Here's one story I think is kind of funny. My dad told me this once. We were playing cards. We used to play cards a lot when I was growing up. And um, not for real money or anything. It was just like gin rummy and crazy eights and stuff like that. He loved it. <laughs> and he would deal like five cards at a time. You go, one, two, three, four, five. There's your hand. One, two, three, four, five. Here's your hand. One, two, three, four, five. Here's your hand. And my brother-in-law, Roger, at the time, just was so mad. He's like, deal them out, Tony. Deal them out. My dad says, in the war, you didn't know if you had time to deal out a hand. You just gave him five cards. And that was your cards. <laughs> you didn't know if you were going to get attacked or if you had to run out or, you know, a plane flew over or you had to get up and get covered and stuff like that so my brother-in-law Roger would say the war is over Tony just get over it and my dad would just laugh because it kind of teased it would tease Roger and it just kind of pushes his button and I think my dad got a lot of entertainment out of it it was pretty funny you know here's this guy he's telling him you know you don't know nothing come on you know nothing about anything kind of pretty funny anyway I have a fun memory with my dad so my dad was married to this woman Dale he went to the Pacific as I said and Dale moved in with my 
mother, my grandmother Mary, and Mary was an alcoholic, as I said, and she didn't speak English, and <laughs> Dale didn't speak Slovenian, so they didn't get along very well. She was always rooting for money, my, my grandmother. She was uh, always looking for money for alcohol, and, um, you know, she wasn't always like that. It was later in life. So Dale left, and she moved out, and she, my, we found out later she got pregnant from somebody else, uh, some other military man. She says, because she really thought my dad wasn't going to be coming home. So she really didn't believe it. And my dad was very, very hurt when he found out much later, because all this time my, my, his wife is sending him all these gushy, extremely gushy letters love you and I's a sweetheart and all these things and I've got some of the photos and things that she sent him and you know he really thought that she was there holding the fort down and being true to him and she says well you know of course that's what you're going to tell him he's over there fighting what are you what are you going to tell him that I'm I'm cheating on you here in America well you know because I don't think you're going to actually come home so my dad the war's over comes through Angel Island and finds out uh, he's demobbed and Angel Island takes all his gear. He's sick of the war, sick of the whole thing. He was only in for a couple years. Throws all his gear into uh, San Francisco Bay. He was bringing home a monkey. My dad loves animals. He always loved animals. He brought home a monkey and he had it on a chain and I guess the monkey bit somebody one of the other guys coming home and that guy got so mad he threw it overboard my dad was just so hateful I mean he just was so mad over that this guy threw the monkey over overboard um, I can't imagine my dad bringing a monkey to home but I guess so he he finds out that his ex-wife that his wife Dale is um, in Fort Ord which is in Sol right off of Salinas where I live now and she was living with her mom who was married to somebody at Fort Ord who was in the military. So my dad is, had written to her and found out and he comes to San Francisco and he says, you know, he wants to see his wife. And there, you know, there's, there's obviously something going on. Um, Dale comes up to San Francisco and I guess they spend the night together and she shows him her da his daughter, her name is Antoinette, named after uh, him, called her Tony, T-O-N-I. She was born during like 1944, 1945. So she's like a year or so old. And then Dale leaves, I guess, the next day. And he, he, and there was some trouble. I don't really know what happened. But my dad um, contacts her mom and um, says, you know, you guys are down in Fort Ord. And he wants to come down there and talk to them. And so... The grandmother, she she arranges a party and doesn't tell them that they're going to be there together. You know, she says she invites Tony, but doesn't tell him that Dale's going to be there. Invites Dale, but doesn't tell him, you know, and vice versa. And they go and they talked and they talked and they talked. They got together, and I think that what happened is my dad found out that Dale had had a child, and that child would have been adopted. And uh, she, I think in Watsonville, so that's near us, who had been born about 1945. And we found him just not too long ago. And he didn't know he was adopted. So my dad, I guess, said that was it. He was done. So here he is married to this woman. He didn't want to go back to Ohio. He was really embarrassed that his wife had cheated on him and had another child from, from somebody else. He was very embarrassed. He didn't know what kind of debts had been there. And besides, California, oh my gosh, compared to Ohio, those horrible winters and so on. So he comes to California. He gets a job working for Spiegel's and he becomes a maintenance, um, moves up to management. Friends introduced him to my mom, which is a totally different story. I'll tell you her story in a little bit. And he marries, oh, he wants to get married. They decide they want to get married. 
and he's married. My mom didn't want to have anything to do with him at first. She, you know, this guy's married. I don't want to have anything to do with him. And they both smoked. It was really kind of funny. So my dad went to Reno and moved up there for six weeks while he got a divorce from his wife. He just said, you know, I have no way of contacting her. Um, you know, I've been abandoned. And he didn't know where she was. He had said that he wanted the child. He wanted Tony. But Dale said, if you take her, I'll kill myself. In fact, I have that letter. I'll kill her and myself if you try to take her from me. And in those days, you know, you just didn't take a child from the mother. She would have had a hundred times better life with, with my dad, I know for sure, um, going through what Tony went through. Um, she's died just a few years ago. And um, she has step, uh, half sisters and brothers. And uh, she was very close to them. But she had a very difficult life. And um, so my dad came to Ohio, settled, I mean, came to California, settled in Salinas, and worked here. And while this happened, um, got a divorce, and then married my mother. So that was 1948. 1949 they got married um, and then my brother and my well first my sister Mary named for my grandmother my dad's mom and then my brother Tony another Anthony and then myself I was named after nobody they uh, I think my dad just liked the name if somebody maybe he'd heard of in World War II somebody's sweetheart or something like that and I was six years after my brother. They were three years apart and then six years later here I come. I was always told, I always thought of myself as a mistake, you know, an accident. My mom said that, you know, if you're born, you're born. That was just the way it was. And that's why we settled in, where we settled in a long way from any family. Um, when I tell you my mom's story some other time, you'll see that there really was no family out here. So we were raised very differently. I had no children, no cousins, no nieces, no nephews. My siblings didn't have children. I didn't, we just didn't have children out here. We had no, my grandparents, nope, nothing. Um, really sad. But, you know, looking at what these people might have been like, I maybe I'm, maybe it was the right thing to do to be, taken away from this family structure that seemed dysfunctional in a lot of ways. I mean, my dad had some good memories, but most of them I thought, oh, geez, dad, wow, that must have been awful, you know? And he's like, well, that's the way you lived, you know? You, you collected coal along the railroads and, and wood to see if you can get so you could heat your house, and it was, you put newspapers in the walls, and you were... You had one outfit and, um, you know, if you got a nickel, then you could go to the movies and buy candy and all this other stuff with your nickel. Uh, they, If they worked, their mom took all the money because she, well, she had to have it to, to live off of, you know, food and so on. Christmas was, um, what they used to do is they would have a bowl and they would, people would come over to visit and they'd put some change in the, in the bowl and some fruit, like an orange. And the kid who got up in the morning first probably got to the got to the money and the fruit. And getting an orange for Christmas was a huge deal. They had a goat. My dad, my grandfather came home after several days of absence, after drinking and gambling, came home with a goat. No idea what happened to the money, but he had a goat. And so my dad just loved that goat. He used to, <laughs> they used to take it out and let it graze in the fields someplace to get food. You know, what are you going to do? So, um, I guess that's my dad's story. And the, the cousins, Anton, the other cousin that lived in Ohio that had the store, they continued to flourish. The family's done well. Uh, I think they had like 10 kids or something like that who've gone on to have children. And these are their other Gerbics. Oh, I should mention, the Rudy, the one that left home at 13, my dad's stepbrother, the oldest, he changed his name to Gerbitz, G-E-R-B-I-T-Z, 
I don't know if he thought that was a correct spelling or what happened, but there's a whole line of gerbets that are our family, but they're not, they're, uh, they look like they're not related, but they are. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we've traced it to that. We know that that's the way it is. Uh, they all thought they were German. When I went back there, I thought that was hilarious. They thought that we were from Germany. Nobody knew anything about Slovenia at all. And they were always told we were German. It's like, no, we're not German, we're Slovenian. One person, and Anna, um, Anna Antonia, Antonia Anna, or whatever her name was, my dad's step uh, half-sister, she legally changed her last name. Even though she was married, we thought that was odd. She changed her last name from Gerbeck to uh, another spelling and she, we think she did this because that way she didn't have the that lo, didn't look so German it looked like a you know a less German name now she should have known better than know that we we're not German or Slovenian so we never did find out and she was married so we never did quite find out why she would go to the trouble to change her maiden name she's not around to ask her kids aren't around either. She had two boys. And did I get the whole history? Let me think. Everything I know. Um, just must have been in a whole different kind of world. We had, uh, we found out much, many, many years ago that Antoinette, my dad's daughter, who I didn't even know existed until I was 13. They didn't want to tell me. He had no idea where she was. She discovered us. She looked for us and found found my dad when I was 13. And that's when my parents had to tell me that I had a half-sister. I was furious that they didn't tell me. She was like 40. And um, apparently she had had a child when she was a ward of the state when she was 16. And in those days, they took the child from her. They took her away. I don't even know if they told her if it was a boy or a girl because she was underage. And that child was adopted out and had children and I she didn't have a good fate she's there's a lot of problems there and they're still alive so I really don't want to say much but she very sad very very sad um, as I said the rest of the family on Anthony's side all did well they all went on to have established careers, education, and, and so on. I guess my grandfather was kind of like the loser, or the black sheep, or I don't know what you'd call him. When he died, he they had a wake for him in the grocery store. Get this at, at the A Gerbic Groceries in Collingwood, Ohio. They lay the way they would do it is they would um, close down the store. They put the the coffin in the main part of the grocery store and that's where they had the funeral or the wake and that's what they did with my dad grandfather so <laughs> I don't know it's a different time and that was that so uh, my grandmother is buried in Ohio I've seen her grave it's nicely kept this is a loving mother and um, wife I don't know what she might have been like when she was younger and still a reasonably good person. Oh, she had a sister. Check this out. She had a sister who came here too, who, was, who spoke English, who married a man whose last name is Sampson. And that sister, uh, John Sampson, that was her their son. Uh, John Sampson and my dad were very close. And uh, I knew him. I actually remember him. He had a he had a wife named Kay, K E Y, and they were in the Amish area of Ohio. And uh, we used to go back and visit with them, and we'd meet these Amish people. Whoa, what stories I could tell you about that! But uh, Kay and John had one child that died of a very bad, serious illness, um, and it was so serious that it went into the textbook back there, a medical journal. They had a um, because it was such a, a bad birth defect or something and I don't know what it was but it was some kind of uh, birth defect that they didn't know a lot about and so they 
it's in some medical textbook somewhere in Ohio but so we had no cousins from there nothing no family from there but so John Sampson um, would be a, a um, cousin as well but again that line has gone no idea the families there you know they just didn't have children and the children they had died and so we're almost all died out the Gerbics the only Gerbic families left are you and your brother and uh, my brother had no children and my sister had no children so Antoinette Scott has died as I said and her uh, children which we're not even don't even really know they barely even knew their mother she finally found her daughter when she was probably her daughter was in her 40s her daughter would be my age and um, uh, the Gerbics from Anthony the ones calling with grocery store Gerbics and there's a lot of them so if you ever find a Gerbic it's probably their descendant because there certainly isn't any from our area the, the Gerbics line is almost dead in that way whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. But I want to preserve this history by at least telling you this story so that you have it, just in case you want to know someday. Okay, I'm home now. Just driving in to uh, a couple turns and I'll be in the house. And uh, I'll, actually, I'll be seeing you then when I get there. Bye.